Uh, this presentation is based on uh, some work I did for a think tank a couple of years ago. The internet has changed a lot of things. First of all, a uh, show of hands, does everybody know what crowdsourcing is? No? Okay. Well, so for the few people whose hands did not go up, crowdsourcing is about using uh, large groups of people to uh, solve problems. And it can be implemented in a number of different ways. Uh, so, you know, the internet has changed our life in a lot of ways. Uh, the new mobile devices are making equally significant changes and extending the reach of the internet. Uh, this slide uh, shows an example, and local mind should be up here as well, uh, but the slide was actually created before you guys uh, got together. Uh, but these, all these companies rely exclusively on crowdsourcing for everything they do. Uh, really there are two or three categories of this type of crowdsourcing, but you'll see the predominant a uh, number of these companies rely on sort of human generated content uh, or analytics, right? Getting humans to solve uh, particular problems. Then you've got sort of the exception of the slide, which is SETI at home, which actually uses the computing resources of its uh, subscribers or members of the crowd uh, to uh, do. Uh, useful work that could not affordably be done uh, in a centralized way. And there are other examples uh, of that as well. So a little bit about crowdsourcing, there are three major uh, criteria in uh, putting together a crowdsourcing solution. Uh, the crowd needs to be diverse, it should be qualified for the type of work uh, it's being asked to do, and it should be properly sized. And it's beyond the scope of this presentation, but these three, um, these three things come together in a number of different ways uh, to either help or hinder uh, crowdsourcing. Now, how does this relate to intelligence gathering? Well, along with the emergence of the internet as an extremely popular medium for uh, transmitting and uh, receiving information, uh, Equally significant changes have been happening in the intelligence community. So, for instance, ISR is a core function of any military force and extends to paramilitary organizations such as intelligence gathering. Yeah, it's ISR. ISR is intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance. Uh, so these are the three key features of intelligence gathering. Uh, I'll make it bigger. <laughs> uh, so this is just one example of one ISR agency, the Air Force uh, ISR agency, and how they've evolved. So it used to be that ISR units within armed forces were highly classified. Even the membership was highly classified. And you see in a lot of countries uh, that uh, members of ISR units used to have their insignias turned around or were ordered not to wear them uh, off base. So they would actually take the insignias of their units off because it was classified information that these units actually even existed. Uh, that has changed significantly. The Air Force ISR agency now has a Facebook page, a Twitter account, and a website that they use for both recruiting and promotion. Uh, so, you know, this is definitely not your grandfather's ISR, which was also mostly involved in sort of uh, image analysis and processing was a large part of that. We'll get to that in a second. So this year's DARPA budget. Uh, DARPA, for those of you who may not be familiar with sort of internet history, is the uh, Department of Defense uh, Advanced Research Project Agency. These are the guys who actually did invent the internet. Uh, and uh, you know, develop some of the earliest uh, components that are today core features of the internet. So this is their budget for this year. Uh, they are spending $52 million on crowdsourcing uh, projects. So these are first stage research projects. Uh, in the Transformative Sciences Division, which by the way is the same division that developed the core internet technology. So I'm just going to read quickly, crowdsourcing, 
being large-scale, human-centered networks consisting of potentially thousands or millions of people working in collaboration with large-scale computing power, cloud computing, <coughs> mobile communications devices, and large-scale sta statistical data analysis towards the solution of a unified goal. All right. And then it goes on to talk about what they're trying to do is develop applicable means of harnessing large numbers of network people to collaboratively solve key problems in, in ISR, image processing, and other apps. I'm not going to read the last one, but we'll take a look at some of the key terminology they're using in this budget document. So we're talking about using uh, thousands or millions of people, cloud computing, and mobile communications devices. So there you can instantly uh, get the visual of thousands or millions of mobile devices talking to some central cloud uh, and capture the experience base of users and systems. So those are those two different types of crowdsourcing. We saw in uh, really the first slide where uh, you know, the human intelligence factor and the processing capabilities of the, uh, of the devices being used by the crowd. And validated the key component here for intelligence work being validation in environments which may be compromised by the adversary. So it's a very interesting problem. I mean, you can even see from this terminology um, some of the challenges that will be faced. So I just want to focus on the mobile device thing for a second. Uh, this here is an image, this is the CONOPS or concept of operations for an advanced battlefield ground sensor network uh, that's currently in deployment and used in the US Armed Forces. Canadians have a few of these, but uh, I don't think they have the batteries. Um, so uh, it consists of essentially these uh, sentry nodes here that come together to form a, what's called a wireless tactical mesh network. And these are ground sensors that can uh, sense uh, sound, uh, vibration, uh, they've got imaging sensors in IR, uh, traditional uh, imaging, and they all talk to each other and they talk to a tactical gateway which then relays the information back to a base. Now, for all you guys who work in sort of cloud or systems engineering, if you take those sentry nodes and you replace them with something like a web server, you take the tactical gateway and replace it with something like an app server, and then the base being a DB server, it quickly resembles your sort of standard three-tier architecture scenario. Now, let's take a look at those ground sensors and the types of features they have. Talking about an 802.15.4 antenna, active GPS, serial and analog sensor interfaces, four IR motion detectors, uh, lanyard attachment, and battery. Now, let's look at the current generation of cell phones. Microphone, assisted GPS, multiple uh, frequency communications capabilities, uh, 8 megapixel digital camera with, uh, as Ann was uh, pointing out, uh, digital image processing capabilities on the actual device, gyroscopic and accelerometer motion detecting, and a micro USB interface to attach other sensor packs such as, uh, you know, specific RF sensors, radiometers, any type of thing, chemical, uh, chemical analysis engines, things like that. So you can see that one of the most advanced battlefield sensors is competing rather poorly with the devices that we're all carrying around in our pockets. So if we can, if intelligence services can leverage the capabilities of the mobile devices that we're all carrying around, this opens up, this means Everything is accessible. The battlefield has extended. The sensor network of these intelligence agencies has grown tremendously. And the key point from this is that finding the needle in the haystack is much easier when the haystack helps you look. And this is a key uh, feature of counterinsurgency uh, techniques today, is getting the populace and the crowds in which uh, enemy militants may be hiding and using the crowd itself to help identify them. So some examples of this, uh, there's uh, an Israeli organization called Sophir and uh, uh, what they do, they have a number of active programs but essentially they enlist the aid of both uh, Israelis and uh, expats and foreign nationals 
to sort of submit information and basically they, they it's a civilian military partnership and they use civilian resources to uh, essentially hunt for terrorists online. Uh, but getting into the social networking aspect, uh, we can see uh, programs like those developed by the University of Maryland that help you visualize and data mine into social networking. And this goes back to the slide we saw with the ISR agency having Facebook pages. So when you friend them, should you friend them on Facebook, they now have access to all of your contacts and they, they're, they, they're, getting, they're gaining depth uh, and visibility into the broader social network that they can then go and map. So the first stage in this type of social networking analysis is creating a social graph. Okay, mapping all the connections between the individual nodes that you have direct access to or secondary access to. Second part is identifying the gatekeepers. So your target, or what you think may be your target, who are the gatekeepers that are gonna let you get into their social graph and expand your visibility into their part of the world. Once you do that, you can do, go to the target acquisition phase in which you're really trying to find out information about a particular individual and you can use both your human intelligence and signals intelligence uh, combined to go after that target. But crowdsourcing works both ways and it can often be a double-edged sword. So the same way that the US military may be using crowdsourcing to find insurgents in uh, Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, WikiLeaks can use that same style to uh, elicit information from within the US armed forces and produce things like these visualizations of attacks in Afghanistan. Now whether you want that information public or private uh, really depends on what you're doing with it and what the impact is to your operations. The other side of this sort, sort of the freedom aspect of organizations like WikiLeaks is Jerdab.ir. So this is a website that came up uh, during the Green Revolution in Iran uh, a couple of years ago. And essentially this is a government website and what they're doing is identifying uh, identifying protesters and they're asking the public in Iran to identify the protesters to the government presumably so they can be arrested and dealt with. But again, things cut both ways. The Green Movement's response to this was to post pictures of uh, undercover government agents on their website and ask for information identifying them. Uh, so as you can see, things really can go uh, a number of different ways. It's a tricky new area that we're entering into. And I just want to point out, uh, who here has used uh, Local Mind or High Score House? All right, so quite a few of you. Now, who here, aside from the people involved in those particular projects, can tell me what access they've given those programs to on their mobile devices. Everything. Pretty much everything. So these small, developer, small development shops now have access to your entire sensor package that you carry around with you. And whether that code is vetted or not is really a big concern. Uh, especially when you've got Defense Department employees carrying these devices or you know thousands of users subscribing or having paid to download or downloading for free uh, an application developed by a potentially hostile organization or at least compromised. So we saw the Stuxnet virus last year, but uh, you know, uh, High Score House, Local Mind, right? Where were those things developed? Well, Honestly, they were developed in an open office about, you know, five meters from where I sit. So injecting something into their code would not have been inconceivable. Uh, and in fact, anyone who then would have subscribed, you know, their systems that they're carrying around, that they're accessing emails and communicating with their friends, as well as walking around, sending their GPS uh, location data and camera data back to some central repository, that can all be hijacked very easily. Uh, so, next time you're about to download that free iPhone app that does something really cool, 
question is, why is it free? And who am I really giving access to? And what access rights are they having? Uh, so those are uh, just some interesting points. Thank you.